Have a seat. Before we jump into the book of Ecclesiastes this morning, I thought it'd be fun to let you guys know what it is I do when I'm not preaching. So uh, I do work the whole week, not just Sunday mornings. And sometimes I'm preparing sermons, but other times I get to do fun things like teach. That's actually my favorite thing to do. I get to teach and train our fellows here at Grace Bible Church. Our fellows program this year is more than 20 recent college graduates who commit to spend two years on our staff team serving in a variety of ministries. And during those two years, we get to teach them in Bible and in theology and train them in practical ministry skills so that they can look at the thought of working in vocational ministry after their time at Grace. So here's a few of our fellows I'd like to share this with you this morning. My name is Micah Holman. I studied civil engineering at Texas A&M with the intention to design and develop communities. But by the end of my senior year, I felt guided into a different direction. Could I develop communities through vocational ministry? My name is Gavin Sledge. While at Texas A&M, I was in the Corps of Cadets. I'm planning to join the military. However, I had the opportunity to serve as a camp counselor at a summer camp. Investing in the lives of high school students made me wonder if full-time ministry was a fit for me. My name is Chamela Pinella. Being discipled by a fellow at Grace was one of the most impactful aspects of my college experience. Just as someone had done for me, I wanted in turn to invest a couple years of my life in facilitating the spiritual development of college women. I chose to be a fellow at Grace because of the investment I knew I'd receive from the staff. As a fellow, I have relationships with pastors who value my spiritual development and care for me deeply as a friend. After I graduated from Texas A&M, I chose to stay in College Station because of the strategic role this place is playing in the gospel movement across our country and around the world. God is doing something unique here, and I wanted to be a part of it. Being a fellow at Grace, I'm not just an observer on the sidelines, but I'm an integral part of the team, carrying real responsibility and doing real ministry. At Grace Bible Church, we believe in developing the next generation of leaders who will reach our community, our campus, and our world for Jesus Christ. For over 20 years, our Fellows Program has provided hands-on ministry experience, mentorship, and the opportunity to help lead and shape the culture at Grace Bible Church. Our partnership with Dallas Theological Seminary provides an unparalleled theological foundation for our Fellows that will serve them for the rest of their lives. Have you ever wondered if you'd be a good fit for full-time ministry? Come find out. It really is the most fun thing I get to do during the week is work with these recent graduates who are considering vocational ministry or missions for the rest of their lives. If you've wondered if you could fit in that role, if you could serve God vocationally in the church or on the mission field or in a religious charity, we'd love to have you join us. So just go onto the website. The applications are available there. They're due February 21st. Fill them out. You can specify whether you'd be interested in college ministry, youth, children's, missions, worship, creative arts, all kinds of opportunities for you. So we'd love to have you join us for a couple years. Uh, Also, I'd like to remind you, if you're looking at mission this summer, those applications are due like next week, February 12th. You need to get summer missions applications in. So we'd love to have you guys look at those opportunities. Well, this morning we're going to go back to Ecclesiastes and we're going to talk about a subject that is both important and practical. We're going to talk about money. Now, money is important to God. That's obviously why we're talking about it this morning. I don't know if you knew this, but when Jesus came and began to teach, 25% of his teachings and one out of three parables are on the subject of wealth. But they're about money. He spoke about money more than almost any other topic. So money is important to God, and it's clearly important to our society. If you just look at some of the most popular songs over the last 50 years and how many of them have the word money in them, you've got 1960, Money, That's What I Want by Barrett Strong, 1973, Money by Pink Floyd, 1976, Money, Money, Money by ABBA, 1985, Money for Nothing, Dire Straits, 1990, Money Talks by ACDC, 2012, Make the Money by Macklemore, and there's tons of others. I'll just stop there for time. We live in a world that is consumed with thoughts of money. 
All the time we're thinking about how to make money. We're dreaming about how to spend money. We're considering how to save money. We're worried about people taking our money. Most people spend most days thinking about money because it's money that makes our world run. It's what makes our world work. Politics and education and science and technology, they are run, they are driven by money. And so you cannot make it through this life without spending a lot of your time thinking about money and wealth. And so it's not a surprise that Solomon is going to talk about money a lot in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's the second idol that we're going to confront and the book of Ecclesiastes, because we live in a world and in a society where most people worship money as an idol. Now, let's just review from last week. What is an idol? It's not a little statue of wood. An idol is a person or thing other than God that you cling to for significance and satisfaction. Anything other than God that you turn to to make your life work, that is an idol, a false god. And Ecclesiastes is designed to crush the idols in our lives so that we can cling to God alone. And so this week's idol is money, is wealth. Now, let's, let's be clear here. No one actually worships money because money is boring, a, a dollar bill, it's white and green, and who wants to play with that? There's nothing you can do with that. No one actually worships cash, what we worship is what we think that money can buy for us. And when you think about the idol of money, what can it buy for us? It's a two-headed idol. There's two things that people are trying to get when they worship money, either satisfaction or security. That's what money's about. We worship money not for the sake of a dollar bill, but because we want to use money to purchase satisfaction or security. So a lot of people are chasing money to find satisfaction. This is the person who overspends, constantly looking for that next thing to buy. That's what he lives for. He wakes up in the morning thinking about what he gets to buy today. That's why he goes to work. That's why he does everything that he does is because he just wants to buy that next thing because he hopes it'll finally make him happy. And he's incredibly happy as he unwraps it, but as soon as it's unwrapped, he's already thinking about the next thing to go buy. That's the person who is chasing satisfaction in money. He wants it to make him feel good in the eyes of the world. So lots of people worship money for satisfaction, but I think a lot of us in this room, we worship money for security. We worship money because we believe that money equals protection. The more money you have in the bank or in your retirement fund, the safer you are. This is the person who underspends. Very hard for them to part with their money and spend anything on themselves or on other people because they just want to save it all because the more money they have, the safer they feel. Okay, so in this world, most people worship the idol of money because they want to find either satisfaction or security in it. So this morning, we're going to see what Ecclesiastes has to say to us, and we're going to begin with the bad news. Solomon is going to walk us through why money makes a lousy God, why it's a very poor idol. He wants us to understand the limits of our wealth. He's going to tell us four limits, four things that put a boundary on what your money can accomplish and that make it a very poor God to worship. Okay, so let's jump right in. Let's see what Solomon has to say about the limits of wealth. We're going to start with the first reason that people worship money, because they want to find satisfaction. They want happiness. They want contentment through the things that they can buy with money. That was Solomon. Look at me at chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes. We've read this before. Let's just review it for ourselves. Chapter 2, starting in verse 4. 
Solomon says, I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself in which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had homeborn slaves. Also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. As far as we can tell, Solomon would have been a multi-billionaire in today's money. There was literally nothing in the ancient world he could not buy. He had the resources not only of his own nation, but all nearby nations gave him money. So he had, practically speaking, infinite wealth. He could buy anything. And so what did all those possessions bring? What did all that wealth purchase for him? Look at verse 11. Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind and there was no profit under the sun. There was no profit. What he means is it didn't make his life any better. He was not one step closer to happiness and contentment after all of that expenditure, after all of the accumulation of that wealth. And that leads him, turn to chapter 5, verse 10. Chapter 5, verse 10. Solomon says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. His point is that if you're chasing after money because you think it will satisfy you, it will make you feel good inside, you need to take it from Solomon on faith. Money can never satisfy you. Never. It's not that you don't have enough money to be satisfied. No, it's that money by its very nature can never satisfy your soul. Even if, like Solomon, you had infinite money, you win the Powerball, you got a billion dollars, it will not change a thing. It will not satisfy the cravings of your soul because money can't. It's like trying to slake your thirst by drinking sand. You can drink all the sand in the Sahara Desert. It will never satisfy your thirst because it's not in the nature of sand to satisfy thirst. So it is not in the nature of money or wealth or possessions to satisfy the human soul. doesn't matter how much you have. You're just going to chase and chase and chase more ridiculous things trying to fill that vacuum in your heart. That's why really rich people buy really silly things. So there's a, a sheik in Saudi Arabia who had 37 cars in his garage, but apparently that was not enough. So for car 38, he bought a Mercedes Benz covered in diamonds worth $48 million. Now look at that. That is the dumbest car I've ever seen. Because you pull up to a red light and what are we all going to do? We're going to grab our tire irons and go at it. Just pop one off. Come on. You try to go to H-E-B in that thing. You're going to have to bring a security guard in a trailer to watch over it while you go buy your milk. You get in a fender bender in that? You're not talking $2,000. You're talking $20 million to fix it. That is a ridiculous purchase. Here's another one. This is a $16 million iPhone. The home button is a 26-carat diamond. What's the problem with that phone? It's an iPhone 5. <laughs> it's already two years out of date. Silly rich guy. You're, all your diamonds could not keep your phone from becoming obsolete. Now the college kid with an off-the-shelf iPhone 6 has it better than you. These stories of ridiculous, conspicuous consumption make us laugh, but they should also make us really sad. Because why does someone buy something like that? Because he's an addict. He's a slave. He's addicted to that feeling he gets when he buys something new, but as soon as he's unwrapped it, he's empty again, and so he chases after the next thing, and it's got to be bigger. It's got to be more. Wealth has made a fool of him just like it made of Solomon, just like it made of many of history's richest people. John D. Rockefeller is actually the richest man ever in the history of America. When he died, his fortune in today's dollars was estimated to be $336 billion. 
It's pretty much infinite wealth that Rockefeller had. But he concluded, I've made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. Not a little happiness, none. Henry Ford, who built Ford Motor Company, worth billions of dollars, looked back at his life too late and realized, I was happier when doing a mechanic's job. Money cannot make you happy. It cannot satisfy you. It cannot fill that hole in your heart because that's not what money does. It will never satisfy the cravings of the human heart. And so if you're the kind of person who thinks that that next purchase will finally satisfy you, that next home you buy, that next car you buy, next clothes you buy, next jewelry you buy, next gadget you buy, you need to learn from Solomon and Rockefeller and Ford if they could not find satisfaction with all of their infinite wealth, neither are you. It's never going to satisfy your heart. Money makes a lousy God because it cannot satisfy you. That's the first limit of wealth. So that speaks against those who worship money for the satisfaction they think it will bring them. Now let's talk about those of us who worship money for the safety, for the security we think it will bring into our lives. What Solomon wants us to understand is it does not matter how much money or wealth you have, the nature of wealth, it can never make you safe. It's not possible for it to make you safe. It is a lousy God if you are depending upon wealth to protect you. It reminds me of what my dad and I were doing this weekend. He had a a wall of, of their house that had rotted on the inside from water damage. But when you looked at the wall, it didn't look bad. The paint was relatively new. There were no holes, no stains, no tears in it. The wall looked good, but then there were parts of it that when you leaned on it, it would just give way. Well, that's the person who's trusting in money to make them safe. Looks good. World tells you. You got a million bucks in the bank, you're good to go. So you lean on it, and then you find out too late it was a false god that will let you down when you depend on it. Solomon tells us why. He's going to give us three reasons why you cannot count on your wealth to make you safe in life. Let's keep looking at chapter 5, pick it up in verse 11. First, he says, when good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? This is a very practical observation about life. Solomon's saying that the more money you have, the more money you have to spend. It's just the nature of the thing. When you have more money, you have to pay more money for people to protect your money. you got to pay banks and bankers and investment counselors and security guards and storage facilities. you got to pay to protect your money. And you got to pay to protect all your stuff. So now you got to hire people to go clean all your houses and mechanics to service all your cars and sailors to sail your boats. And you're just spending all this money hand over fist to care for all your possessions and then the government shows up they're going to take their share and the more you got the more they take and so he's just observing in life the more money you have the more money is going to flow out and it's not just money it's not just people that you have to pay it's also all the people who want to get their hands on your money Solomon wants us to understand money complicates relationships because you got a lot of money now your kids are your heirs and your friends are your entourage, and you never know if people like you or just are there for your money. They just want to get their hands on it. Solomon wants us to understand that there is a blessed peace that comes from a simple life. When you don't have a lot of stuff, then you don't have to pay to protect all your stuff. When you don't have a lot of stuff, then you don't have a lot of people knocking on your door trying to get their hands on your stuff. A simple life can be a beautiful life. So money, it does not bring the safety and security you think because more people must be paid. Second reason that money isn't good for security, look at verse 12. The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whatever, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. Just an observation of life. The the middle class person who works hard during the day to earn the money that his family needs, he sleeps well at night. Not every night, but most nights he can sleep at peace. Compare that to the rich person. 
the multimillionaire who is running companies and making huge investments and managing incredible assets. He's always worried that he's going to make a bad decision that's going to cost millions of dollars. He's always worried that someone's going to try to fraud him or steal his money. He's always thinking about what to do next. He can't sleep at night. There's no peace in that. Again, a simple life can be a blessed life. Look at the words of Vanderbilt, another one of, rich, of America's richest men. He said, the care of 200 million is enough to kill anyone. There is no pleasure in it. I talk about a first world problem. That's a problem we would all really like to have. Got to care for 200 million bucks. But he wants to understand, if you had $200 million, $200 million today, you would not sleep better tonight. Because money does not bring peace. If anything, it increases anxiety. Now, why? Why does it increase anxiety? Third reason that Solomon says that money can't be relied upon to make you safe. Because it could be lost at any moment. Look with me at verse 13. There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. When those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. So you've got this guy who his whole life he's hoarded wealth. He's worked like crazy, denying himself, denying other people, saving all the money he can because he believes it will protect him and his family. And then one bad decision and it's all gone. All gone. That's why Solomon reminds us in Ecclesiastes 9, the race is not always won by the swiftest, the battle is not always won by the strongest, prosperity does not always belong to those who are the wisest, wealth does not always belong to those who are the most discerning, nor does success always come to those with the most knowledge, for time and chance may overcome them all. You are not master of your money. No, because chance has a lot to do with whether or not you have money tomorrow. You could lose it all tonight, whether through a bad decision you make or through someone stealing it or through just bad luck that's completely out of your control. In 1946, after World War II, the nation of Hungary went through what economists call hyperinflation. That's where the price of goods skyrockets and so your money, the value of your money collapses. So throughout 1946, the daily rate of inflation in the nation of Hungary was 200%. meant that prices doubled every 15 hours. So you wake up today, go buy a gallon of milk for two pango. That was the name of their dollars, their currency, two pango. Go to sleep tonight, wake up tomorrow morning, same gallon of milk, six pango. Economists added it up. Over the course of that year, the inflation rate was 13 quadrillion percent. I can't picture that. That's too big for my brain. So here's some pictures to bring it home to you. You got a shop owner sweeping all his money down the gutter, completely worthless. Then you got a woman lighting a cigarette with a one billion pango note. So I want you to picture that, that you are 75 years old in 1946 Hungary. You spent your whole life working like crazy to build a business. You saved all of your money. You did everything right so that now you have one billion pango. You're a billionaire. You got an incredible amount of money. One year later, it's not even worth the money or the value of the paper it's printed on. Worth nothing more than something to light a cigarette with. You lost it all and you had no control over it. There's something like 53 hyperinflation events that have happened in the world just this century. It could happen at any time, in any place, and your wealth is gone. Again, it's a rotten wall. You lean on it, it will collapse. You cannot count on money to protect you because you cannot control it. It is a lousy God. It will let you down when you need it most. But even if you get lucky and you don't lose your money in the course of this life like so many other people have, third limitation to wealth, well, you still don't get to take it with you. Wealth doesn't travel well. We don't take any of our wealth with us into the next life. Look with me in verse 15. 
Solomon says, as he had come naked from his mother's womb, so he will return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. This also is a grievous evil, exactly as a man is born. Thus he will die. So what is the advantage of him who toils for the wind? Who toils for the wind? The idea is you work your whole life to earn all of this money. You are chasing after the wind because you can't hold on to it because it's all gone the moment you die. You, You can't take any of it with you. The Egyptians did not believe that. The Egyptians believed that you get to take your wealth with you when you die, and so that's actually why they built the pyramids. I mean, I know a pyramid is just a big tomb where they buried their kings, the pharaohs, surrounded by treasure chambers where they would place all of the pharaoh's earthly goods so he could take them with him into the next life. And so King Tut, they built a massive burial room for him and placed him in a golden coffin surrounded by golden chariots so that he could take them with him into the next life. 3,000 years later, 1922, they opened up King Tut's tomb and what did they find? All the gold. It's all still there. He didn't take any of it with him. It just sat unused for 3,000 years under a pyramid. Because you don't get to take it with you. Money does not last. No matter how nice a house you have, how nice a car, how nice a clothes, how nice a jewelry, how much money in the bank, it is all gone the moment you die. None of it goes with you. Money makes a lousy God because it cannot satisfy us, it cannot make us safe, and it doesn't go with us. But here's the the worst thing about money. Greatest limitation of all, money distracts you from what actually can satisfy you, make you safe, and go with you into the next life. That's the worst part about money, the most dangerous thing about it. Solomon tells us this interesting story later in the book, chapter 9. He says there was once a small city with a few men in it, and a mighty king attacked it, besieging it and building strong siege works against it. However, a poor but wise man lived in the city, and he could have delivered the city by his wisdom. But no one listened to that poor man. So I concluded that wisdom is better than might, but a poor man's wisdom is despised. No one ever listens to his advice. What Solomon is noticing is that humans are remarkably foolish. We get distracted by shiny things. We get blinded by wealth. That's what we pay attention to. We, we see who has money. We see who doesn't have money. We fixate on money, on wealth, on possessions, and we take our eyes off the things that really matter. The things that could really make life better, like love and truth and wisdom like this poor man brought. We take our eyes off what matters. That's the danger of wealth. It cannot satisfy you or make you safe, and it can take your eyes off of the only things it can. Jesus spoke about that in his teachings, in that famous verse where he said, no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. If you chase after money, it will pull you away from God. There is no other way. You cannot hold on to the idol of money and God. No, no, no. You're going to chase one or the other. If you're chasing after money, if your goal in life is to make money, either to satisfy your heart or make you feel safe, you will be pulled further away from God. Money makes an awful God, a lousy idol. It cannot satisfy you, cannot make you safe, cannot go with you, and it will distract you from the things it can. That's the bad news. Now let's turn to the good news. Solomon's not all negative when it comes to money. He's got some really wonderful things to tell us about money, about wealth, and the basic idea that I want you to understand, if you want to think rightly about money, you need to understand. Money makes a lousy God, but a wonderful gift. That's the basic thing Solomon wants you to understand about your money. It makes a lousy God, but a wonderful gift. Let's keep looking at chapter 5, start in verse 18. He says, here's what I have seen to be good and fitting to eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him. For this is his reward. 
Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. I think there's this tendency sometimes among Christians to see all the bad stuff that money can buy and all the bad things people do to try to get money and then we tend to think of money itself as evil. It's like the evil of things we do with it kind of rubs off on money. It feels like this icky thing to us. No, it's not. Money is actually a gift. A gift that God has given to you. However much you have, however much money, however much wealth, however many possessions, that's God's gift to you that according to Solomon, God has given you to be enjoyed. It's part of the reason God gave you money so that you could spend it on things you enjoy. Okay, so when you go to the store and you buy that nice thing you've been saving up for, don't feel guilty about that. When you go out and buy a nice steak to eat, don't feel guilty about that. God wants you to enjoy things with your money. So for me, I buy roses for Julie, Legos for my kids, and car parts for me. Do we need any of those? No. Julie has plenty of flowers. My kids have infinite Legos. I hate them. And I have (laughs) way more car parts than I need. Most of them are just to make my car faster. No one needs that. We don't need that, but we enjoy it. And so it's okay. God says, please, spend money on things you enjoy. Because why? Because God is kind. You have a kind father who loves to watch you enjoy his good gifts. So part of the reason God has given you money and wealth is so you can spend it on things you enjoy out of gratitude to him. He loves to watch you enjoy the money he's given you. Second reason that God has given you this gift of money is because it's a gift that makes life easier. That's what Solomon's getting to. Life is easier. You're not so caught up in the, in the pain and suffering of life if, if you have money. It can solve a lot of things. Now, again, money can't make you safe in any absolute sense, but it can solve a lot of the little annoyances of life. Solomon says in chapter 7, for wisdom provides protection just as money provides protection. Money is a gift from God that can fix a lot of problems in your life. I'll give you an example. This last year, our air conditioning went out. Now, 10 years ago, when Julia and I were just barely trying to make it, and we're just trying to pay our bills month to month, if our AC went out, that would have caused an incredible amount of stress. I would have had to look at taking out a loan to fix that. But now we've been saving money for emergencies like this. So the AC breaks, and what do I do? Call a guy to fix it. It's done. Boom. My money fixed that. That's part of the reason God has given you money, to grease the wheels of life so that life goes better. Now, so far, you probably like what's on the board. Those are some good things to do with your money. Spend it on things you enjoy. Spend it in ways that make life easier. But you know we're not done yet. Solomon has one more thing he wants us to understand about this gift of money that God has given us. Turn to chapter 12. You know where we're headed. End of chapter 12. Third thing that Solomon wants you to understand about your money, it's a gift that comes with strings attached. A gift that comes with strings attached. Look at the most important verse in the whole book. Chapter 12, verse 13. The conclusion when all has been heard is, fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. In other words, people worship money because they want to find satisfaction or security in their money, but we've just proven you can't. Can't find it there. Where can you find satisfaction and security? Only in God. And according to the author of this part of the book of Ecclesiastes, the only way for God to give you satisfaction and security deep in your soul is for you to trust and obey him. In every area of life, including how you spend your money, if you want to have a life full of satisfaction and security from God himself, you must trust and obey in every area. You've got to trust God. That's where it begins. You've got to trust that while your money can't save you, God can. Because he sent his son to die for your sins and rise from the dead so you could have life as a free gift. 
Forgiveness as an absolutely free gift. All you have to do is say, yes, God, I I want that. I trust that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. So this life begins with trust, but then it continues in obedience. God expects us to obey him in every area of life. Now, what does it look like to obey God with your money? Well, as the men head back to prepare communion, let let me introduce you to what is probably the most important verse in the New Testament on how to use your money in a way that honors God. It's in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is what it looks like to obey God with your money. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all good things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future. Basic idea of this passage So what God expects you to do with your wealth is first you share it. Then you get to spend some on yourself. First you share it with people who are in need and and with God's kingdom, with missionaries, with the church, with charitable organizations, with your family, with your neighbors. First you share your money and then you can enjoy spending the rest of it on yourself and on your family. So do you want to enjoy that steak dinner? Well, make sure that first you give money to people who can't even afford beans. Is it okay to enjoy a steak dinner? Yes, as long as that's not what you do every night rather than share some of that money with people who are in need. Okay, so is it okay to go buy that new car? Yes, so long as first you shared your money with God and with his people and with those in need. First you be rich towards God and other people, then you enjoy the gift of money God has given you. That's the order of things. And so long as you obey that order that you give first, that you're rich first towards God and others, then God enables you to enjoy the gift of wealth he's given you. But let's be honest, that's hard to do. Because any money that I give away is less money I get to spend on me. If I give money away, I get a smaller stake, slower car. I don't like that. It's hard to make that sacrifice to part with our money. And so when I feel that it's hard for me to part with that money, what I do is I remind myself of something that Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. When I am tempted to worship my money, to hoard it, to cling to it for myself, I remind myself what Jesus went through on my behalf. That the creator, who literally owns everything, he's richer than Solomon by an infinite margin. Everything belongs to him. He chose to become poor. And when we say poor, we don't mean that metaphorically. Like he really was poor. Poor carpenter's son. Look at Jesus during his ministry. No family, no house, no furniture, No possessions of any kind except literally the clothes on his back. When the soldiers were gambling for Jesus' clothes as he hung on the cross, that's because that's all he had. They're not going and raiding his house for his possessions to split up. No, he had a coat and a shirt, and that's it in the whole world. Jesus became poor and homeless. Why? That's what it took to save you. He had to become poor and homeless so he could die as a criminal, as a neglected man on your behalf, so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could rise from the dead, conquer death for you, so you could live forever. And so when I think about giving my money away, what I remind myself is no matter how much I give, Jesus gave more. No matter how much I give, Jesus gave first. You will never outgive God. He's the greatest giver of all. And so since Jesus, who owned everything, gave up everything on my behalf, it is easier for me to open my hands and part with that money, to share it with others, to give it towards God, to be rich towards him. That's what we're going to celebrate in communion as you guys come forward. It felt weird when I was thinking about communion after a sermon on money. What in the world do I do with this? And then I realized, no, this is perfect. Because the reason we cling to our money so tightly and want it so desperately is because we forget what Jesus did, what we're about to celebrate right here. 
And so the way that you let loose of your money, the way that you begin to approach your money rightly is you remember how much Jesus gave up for you. And so I'm going to ask that as the elements pass, I want you guys to do two things. First of all, I want you to give thanks. I just want you to say thank you to Jesus that he who is infinitely rich became completely poor for you. And then second, I want you to ask God to bring to your mind a person who you can share your wealth with. Now, maybe you say, Blake, I don't have any wealth. Well, you probably have at least something you could share. Maybe it's a dollar. That's all you can share. Maybe it's $100,000 you can share. Whatever it is, I want you to ask God to bring to your mind someone that you can share your wealth with so that you can obey God with your money. Lord Jesus, we believe that you gave your body and your blood for us. We believe that you became poor so that we might become rich, so that we might have life and forgiveness from you. We praise you and thank you for your incredible gift. That's why it breaks our hearts to see how selfish we can be with our money. It's so hard for us to give, even though you've given everything for us. We pray that you would humble us, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would help us to become generous towards others. I pray, Father, that we would be a church that shares, the church that gives to those in need, to, to people who haven't yet heard about Jesus. I pray that we would be a church that is rich towards you and towards others. And then I pray that through the richness of our giving, Lord, that then we might be able to truly enjoy the money you've given us, that we would be able to, to spend and enjoy without guilt, knowing that first we've given to you. Lord, we praise you. We thank you that you are a God whom we will never outgive. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen.